Hey guys, welcome to our next lesson. Today, we're gonna do another significance test for a proportion, but this time the test will be two-sided. So a two-sided significance test for a proportion. So you may recognize this scenario from a homework problem or two that you've done. So Simon is unsure if 12% of all students at his large community college are left-handed. He randomly samples 100 students and 16 are lefties. So that's 16 out of 100, obviously 16%, which is not 12. So we make a note of that, put that in the back of our minds because that is some directional evidence that it might not be 12% at this large community college who are left-handed. So the question is, does Simon have convincing evidence that the proportion of all students at his college who are left-handed is not 12%? So in this case, it's a two-sided test because he doesn't have any inkling one way or the other. It's not like he thinks the school has a lot more than 12% left-handers or a lot less than 12% that are lefties. He just is unsure whether it is 12%. So he's more like a, he's more curious than anything. He wants to say, okay, is it really 12%? Let me do the statistical test. So he smartly randomly samples 100 students so that it's a random and representative sample. But he gets 16 out of 100. So maybe when he gets that, he's starting to doubt whether it really is 12% at his college. So let's carry out this, the, the significance test and see where it all turns out. So we're going to do our five-step process, hypotheses, name the test, check the conditions, find the p-value, write your conclusion, HNCPW. So we begin with the hypotheses. So we're going to say this. Uh, we will test the following hypotheses. So we will test. This is what we write. We will test the following hypotheses. Now, when you're writing this, we will test the following hypotheses. When you write that part, here's where you want to insert the significance level. Now, in the question, it doesn't give you one, but it could have. It could have said, it could have said does Simon have convincing evidence at the 1% level? If it said that, then your alpha would be 0.01. If it said, does Simon have convincing evidence at the 10% level, then your alpha would be 0.1. If there's no alpha given, we'll just go with the typical alpha of 0.05. So we will test the following hypotheses at alpha equals 0.05. So you want to state that significance level right at the beginning. So we have a null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. Now, although Simon suspects it might be different than 12%, he's going to run the test under the assumption that it actually is 12%. So we're going to say the null hypothesis is that P is equal to 0.12. And since this is a two-sided test, our alternative is going to be P is not equal to 0.12. As we'll discover later, the mechanics of finding the p-value will be a little bit different because of the two-sided nature of the alternative hypothesis here. So we're not done with that first step, H, because we've done the writing of the hypotheses, we've stated the significance level, but we have to define this parameter called p. So we have to say where p, in this case, is what? Well, p would be the proportion of left-handers at his entire college right? Uh, that would be the population we're talking about, all of the students at this community college. And P is the proportion of those that are left-handed. So where P is the proportion of, here comes that all-important three-letter word, all. So P is the proportion of all students at this college. who are left-handed. That's what P is here. So now H is done, we've done that. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do after this is name the test. And usually we do that as part of setting ourselves up for the conditions that we're gonna check after this. So we'll say if, Conditions are met, because we know that's going to be the third step. So if the conditions are met, we'll do, we will do or we'll do 
a, and this has the same name as the test we did yesterday. It's just a two-sided version of it instead of a one-sided version of it. So a one-proportion z-test. So that's the name of this guy, a one-proportion z-test. It's the only test we know, so it's the only name we know for now. So if conditions are met, we'll do a one-proportion z-test for p, the population proportion. So naturally, we're going to check the conditions next. So let's do it. Okay, so the conditions. First, the random condition, all important, right? It did say in the stem of the problem that he sampled those 100 students randomly. So uh, he sampled 100 students randomly. So this condition checks out, which is good. That means his p hat will be an unbiased estimator of p. So he sampled 100 students randomly, so that checks out. By the way, what is his p hat here? Well, his sample, his sample proportion is 16 out of 100, right? So his p hat is 0.16. That's the sample proportion he got. But again, he's running the test assuming that the true proportion for all the students at the school who are left-handed is 12%. But his p hat is 16%, which of course is different than this. The significance test will tell us how different it is so that we can make a decision on whether we have evidence that the proportion of left-handers at the school is not perhaps 12%. Okay, the next condition, the condition is the 10% condition. We're checking this because we want to use that standard deviation formula, the square root of p times one minus p over n. So we want to use that, so the 10% condition has to hold here. So the sample size, little n, has to be less than 10% of the population size. So his sample size is 100. We don't know the population size. The population is all of the students at this community college. If you solve this for n, you'll get n is greater than or equal to 1,000. They did not tell us how many students were at this school. They just described it as a large community college. So we'll assume that there's more than 1,000 students at this large community college. So we write that. We will assume There are more than 1,000 students at this large, as they described it, community college. We'll just say college here. That he described it as large, we'll assume that means there's more than a thousand students in the school. If there isn't, then the use of that standard deviation formula would be problematic. But we'll assume that there's more than a thousand students in the population. The large counts condition, this is important because otherwise we can't use a normal model for our sample proportions, our sampling distribution of p hats. So we can't use that normal model if this condition is not satisfied. So we check this condition. NP has to be greater than equal to 10 and n times one minus p is greater than equal to 10. Obviously our value of n is 100 since we're sampling 100, but what's p here? Is it 0.16 or is it 0.12? Well remember we're assuming that the true value of p is 0.12, and by the way that's not even a p value, that's just a sample p hat, 0.16. It probably would be different if you took a second random sample of 100. But we're running the test assuming that p is 0.12, so that's the value we're gonna use when we check the large counts condition. So 100 times 0.12 has to be greater than or equal to 10, and 100 times 1 minus that has to be greater than or equal to 10 as well. Turns out both of these numbers are indeed greater than 10. So the good news here is that when we find our p value, and we're looking at that sampling distribution of p hats, we can use a normal model to do it. All right, so we've done the hypotheses with the significance level and the defining of the parameter. We've checked our conditions. We also named the test. I forgot that one. We named the test, and then we checked the conditions. So coming up next, we're going to find that p-value and then write our conclusion. So that's what we're doing next. Okay, so now we're in position to find the p-value. And in order to do so, we need that sampling distribution of the p-hats. Now, because the large counts condition was satisfied, we can use a normal model to describe the sampling distribution of p-hats. So let's draw in that normal curve. So we draw the normal curve. 
And it's important that we understand what this is a picture of, right? This is the distribution or sampling distribution of p hats if the null hypothesis is true. Remember, when we're running the test, we're assuming that the true proportion of left-handers at this community college really is 12%, and then we're going to see if we have evidence against that. So assuming it is 12%, that means the mean of all the p hats is going to be equal to p. Again, we sampled randomly, so this should hold. So the mean of all the p hats should be 0.12. So this is centered at 0.12. Again, we're assuming the null hypothesis is true. All right, the standard deviation of this curve would be equal to this, the square root of p times 1 minus p over n. We verified that we could use that formula because the 10% condition checked out. We think there are more than 1,000 students total at this large school. So let's do our stuff here. So we have the standard deviation of the p hats is equal to the square root of, well, what's p? Well, if the null hypothesis is true, it's 0.12. So we have 0.12 times 0.88 divided by 100. If you work this out, you should get something about 0.0325-ish, I think. All right, so we'll go one standard deviation up. We'll go two standard deviations up. We'll go three standard deviations up. If we go one standard deviation up and we add that 0.0325, we'd get somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.153. If we add two of those standard deviations, somewhere around 0.185. If we actually go three standard deviations to the right, 0.218. Uh, similarly, we could go to the left, one standard deviation, which would take us down to 0.088. Two standard deviations down takes me to 0.055-ish. And then three standard deviations down is like 0.023. But what's the meaning of this, this curve that we're drawing here? Well, here's what it means. It means if it's true that 12% of all the students at this large, this large community college, if it's true that the proportion is 12% for all the students at the school, every time we take a random sample of 100, we're not going to get 12%. But they'll dance around 12% in this fashion. In fact, 95% of the time when we sample 100 students, we should get somewhere between 5.5% and 18.5%, or let's just call it uh, between 6% and 18% are going to be left-handed 95% of the time if we take a random sample of 100, and it's true that 12% of the students are left-handed. Okay, when Simon sampled, he got a, a 0.16 as his p-hat. So let's find 0.16 on the graph here. So 0.16 would be, you know, just to the right of this, 0.153 number, I guess. So here's my 0.16. So we want to know how likely it is to be this extreme. Now, his alternative is two-sided. It's not one-sided. If it was one-sided, greater than 0.12, we know what to do. We would just shade this over here. And this is the critical difference for a two-sided test. Since it's a two-sided test, what we're going to do is find the number on this side, which would be 0.08. So notice 16% is 4% up. I'm going to go 4% down to 0.08, so it's like mirrored image on this side. And if it's a two-sided test, what we're going to do is also shade this region over here. And the p-value for a two-sided test, like this one, is going to be the sum of the two areas that we see here and here. Now, the logic behind why we're doing this is we're not really finding the probability of getting a sample proportion of 16% or higher. We're finding the probability of being at least four percentage points away from 12 whether it's four percentage points away on this side or at least four percentage points away on this side over here. So that's the logic behind a two-sided test. We're going to take the sum of these two areas. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate that p-value next. So our p-value is going to be the following. So p-value is... Well, one of the things you notice is, of course, that these are exactly the same area, right? So I could find this by simply doubling. I could find what I want, that is, by simply doubling this area right here. So we can think of it as two times the probability that our p hat is greater than or equal to 0.16. So for a two-sided test, that's what we're going to do. We're going to double that area there. Because, again, it's not the probability of being 16% or higher. It's the probability of being at least 4% away from 12 in either direction, two-sided. 
Okay, so let's get our z value here. Our z is going to be 0.16 minus that 0.12 number divided by that standard deviation of our curve, which was 0.0325. All right, so calculator time. So we do our stuff in the calculator. And we get, when we do this, uh, 1.23. All right, and we double check with our picture of our normal curve. Does that make sense? I think it does. It's 1.23 standard deviations above 0.12. So my p-value is going to be two times the probability that z is greater than or greater than or equal to, doesn't matter, 1.23. So in other words, two times 1 minus the probability that z is less, since, of course, our table only shades to the left. It does not shade to the right. So it's going to be 2 times 1 minus what? So we look it up on the table. So 1.23, the area to the left of 1.23, according to our table. So it should be somewhere around, let's see, it looks like 0 0.8907. So 1 minus 0 0.8907. And this is going to be 2 times, well, when we do 1 minus 0 0.8907, I think we get 0 0.1093, I'm pretty sure. So if I double that number, this is what our p-value turns out to be. So our p-value is 2 times this, which is, okay, I'll use the calculator for this. So 2 times 0.1093. All right, so it's uh, 0 0.2186. So our p-value is this number, 0 0.2186. So can we be four percentage points away from 12% even if the true proportion is 12% for all students at this large college? And it looks like we can be, right? In fact, over 20% of the time, even if the true proportion is 12%, we're gonna get something this far away, either on this side or on this side. Clearly our p-value is greater than our alpha, so we know what to do. So now it's time to write our conclusion. So let's write our conclusion. Our p-value is larger than alpha. So let's do it. All right, so we write our conclusion, and we'll write it this way. We'll say since our p-value is greater than alpha, so since our p-value is greater than alpha, and that was 0.21 something, I forgot, 0.2186, was that what it was? Yep. 0.2186 larger than 0.05. Do we reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject it? You know what to do. We fail to reject it. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And of course, that's your statistical decision. We want to write in layman's terms what this really means in terms of the left-handers at this college. So we're looking for enough evidence to say that it's different than 12%. Do we have enough evidence to say that it is different than 12%? And of course the answer is no, we don't. So we're gonna say we do not have enough evidence here. So we do not have convincing statistical evidence. So we do not have convincing statistical evidence. that the proportion of all students at this college who are left-handed we'll just say who are lefties So we do not have convincing statistical evidence that the proportion of all students at this college who are lefties is different than 12%. We're not confirming that it definitely is 12%. We're just saying we don't have enough evidence to say that it's not 12% or different than 12%. Now notice when I wrote this conclusion, I did not say having evidence that it's greater than 12%, right? Even though we ended up on this side. Because once you decide to go two-sided, you're gonna write the conclusion that we wrote it, which is this way. We're saying 
Um, we don't have enough evidence to say that it's different than 12%. So even though we ended up on the higher side of 12% in our sample, you cannot write the conclusion as, because it might be tempting to say, uh, we don't have evidence that it's larger than 12%, but you don't want to do that. That's what we would do if it was a one-sided test and Simon thought going in, there were more left lefties at this college than in the typical population. So that's our conclusion. We've done all five steps, the hypotheses with the significance level and the defining of the parameter, the naming of the test, the checking of the conditions, the finding of the p-value, which you can see is different with the two-sided test. And then we compare it to our significance level. We make our statistical decision. And then we write what the conclusion means in real English language.